Jonathan Fires is Professor of Fashion Thinking at the University of Southampton, UK, and he lectures internationally on the interface between popular culture, textiles, and dress. Please welcome Jonathan Fires. Hello, and first of all, I'd like to thank Amy and Colleen and Valerie and the Museum of FRD for inviting me to speak today. The title of my presentation today is taken from the celebrated Japanese photographer Eiko's series of images he took of the renowned and controversial author Yukio Mishima. Entitled Bara Kei, ultimately translated as Ordeal by Roses, although literally meaning killed or punishment by roses, the remarkable series of images largely shot in the Baroque interiors of Mishima's home feature the writer in morbid autoerotic tableau often featuring roses. Roses for Mishima represented the seductive partnership between beauty and cruelty, vitality and decay, a theatrical device emblematic of Mishima's own life. His increasingly reactionary views of society, hurtling towards decadence and decay as he thought it, and even perhaps a form of photographic rehearsal, a prelude to his last sensational act by committing seppuku or ritual suicide by disemboweling. The term ordeal commonly understood as a prolonged period of suffering has an older meaning of a test or a trial where the accused is subjected to severe pain which they must undergo in order to prove if they survive their divine innocence, emerging transformed from their torment. Such a process initially would seem to have little to do with the rose, that most beauteous, delicate and desirable bloom. And yet one only has to touch a rose's thorns or see its all too transient beauty fade and decay to understand not only Mishima and Eiko's utilization of this floral emblem of transformation, but indeed much of the rose's enduring fascination for artists, writers and designers. This image of a decay rose its petals starting to wilt and fall is by Dado Moriyama who as a young photographer worked as the assistant to Aiko on the Ordeal by Roses shoot and who in his subsequent illustrious career revisited the essential duality of the rose its inevitable passage from beauty to decay from death to life a condition that the great philosopher transgressive and surrealist Georges Bataille emphasizes in his seminal 1929 essay The Language of flowers, arguing that more even, moreover even, the most beautiful flowers are spoiled in their centers by hairy sexual organs. Thus the interior of a rose does not at all correspond to its exterior beauty. If one tears off all of the corolla's petals, all that remains is a rather sordid tuft. Even the most perfect of blooms inevitably bears the sign of its impending fall from beauty a condition captured again by another Moriyama image, which at first glance would appear to depict a sumptuously perfect rose. Perfect, that is, until we begin to look more closely at the image and discern amongst its fleshy petals a slight withering and fraying at the edges. The grainy reality of the photograph, capturing all of the rose's imperfections, soon to become more obvious as the flower starts to wilt. The beauty of the rose seduces, its heady perfume intoxicates, its cruel thorns punish, and its glorious petals all too swiftly fade and fall. More than any other bloom, it has fired the imagination of poets, painters and composers, and for centuries has been utilized as a political symbol and as a sign of altered states of consciousness, exemplifying warfare and romance, innocence and immorality, mysticism and transformation. Having previously mentioned Bataille, it is the surrealist perhaps who understood best the rose and its affinity with suffering, and who characteristically saw the rose as the symbol of bourgeois respectability, as Amy de la Haye points out in her chapter on the rose in 20th century fashion. Is this suffocating rose what René Magritte here is presenting in his baffling work, The Tomb of the Wrestlers, with its monstrous bloom that fills the room, blocking out light and air, transforming the mundane living room into a cultivated horticultural nightmare. 
Magritte simultaneously acknowledges and ridicules the Rose's remarkable ability to create sensory spaces, spaces that engulf and territorialize, submerge and transform the body in suffocating perfumed universes of seductive color and beauty. Magritte wrote to his friend, the surrealist Paul Elwa, elucidating that for about two months, I have been looking for a solution to what I call the problem of the rose. And stated that after completion of the research, it can be easily explained that the rose is scented air, but it is also cruel. Um, which was a reference to Elwad's poem, Blasson des Fruits and des Fleurs, Coats of Arms and Flowers, which contains these disquieting lines. Rose like parasite descends from the backdrop and everything in flame evaporates. For the remainder of this presentation, I will attempt to locate how the rose's ability to engulf, stifle and silence has been realized in art and design. How its overwhelming delicacy has paradoxically been translated into notions of defense, resistance and secrecy. And how this metaphor of suffocation an ordeal by roses perhaps, is an essential symbol of our current situation, where the rose takes our breath away, metaphorically by its beauty, physically by its asphyxiating fragrance, and symbolically as a result of its association with systems of power and oppression. It is to the classical world, however, that we are indebted for possibly the first and most notorious instance of rosy immersion that practiced by the juvenile and hedonistic Roman emperor Heliogabalus and unforgettably imagined by the Victorian painter Alma Tadema in his 1888 work, The Roses of Heliogabalus. The work itself is a product of unseasonal rosy extravagance given that Alma Tadema painted it in the winter months of 1887 and in order to recreate the scene in his studio had roses delivered from the French Riviera every week until the work was completed. The scene depicted a variation on what is probably an apocryphal event derived from an account featured in the collection of Imperial Roman biographies contained in the Augustan history. The account tells of the delight the debauched and licentious Heliogabalus took in suddenly releasing a torrent of flower petals on his unsuspecting guests from the retractable roof of his banqueting hall. Many of the drunken revelers were unable to crawl out from beneath this sudden deluge and died in floral suffocation. Whether to be believed or not, this fragrant slaughter has fired the imagination of successive writers and artists ever since. The Roman revelers' pleas of I can't breathe echo through time, a perfumed reminder of the dangers of rosy excess. Stifling surrealist and feminist Penny Slinger here in her 1974 works as she pressed her body and the rose's petals onto the plate of a copying machine and which to continue to perfume our current moments masked and victimized inability to draw breath. Alma Tadema's rosy extravagance finds its sartorial counterpart in the stifling atmosphere of contemporary fashion, or at least before the current pandemic with its ceaseless round of collections, excessive production and inequality. A situation simultaneously critiqued and celebrated here by Raf Simmons in his decor for his debut couture collection for Christian Dior in, 19, in 2012, which took over a million blooms to construct, enclosing its fetid clientele in suffocating rosy unreality. Emile Zola in his 1875 novel, La Faute de l'Abbé Moray, uh, translated as the Abbé Moray Sin, provided arguably the most intoxicating account of death by roses. In the novel, we read of the doomed couple a neurotic young priest, Sergei, and his lover, the wild spirit of nature, Albine, who play out their passions amidst an impossibly rose-filled and overgrown garden of Eden, where rosy sexual metaphors heap up upon each other until the novel's feverish climax with Albine's suicide by roses, a final ecstatic floral extinction. And this passage from the novel makes this clear, from the novel makes this clear. There Albine lay, panting, exhausted by love, her hands clutched closer and closer to her heart, breathing her last. She parted her lips, seeking the kiss which should obliterate her, and then the hyacinths and tube roses exhaled their incense, wrapping her in a final sigh, so profound that it drowned the chorus of roses, and in the culminating gasp of blossom, 
Albin was dead. The irresistible mixture of carnal and spiritual desire that so tortures Zola's priest in the novel finds a number of precedents in more recent Catholic history. The Rose has long been associated with religious mysticism and the Virgin Mary in particular. Mary, especially for those of the Catholic faith, is often regarded as the mystic rose or the rose without thorns, an allusion to the belief that in the Garden of Eden, roses grew without thorns and developed them only after the fall and Adam and Eve's expulsion. Therefore, the immaculately conceived Mary is a rose without thorns, whom believers ask to intercede on their behalf whilst reciting the rosary. Within the context of Catholic mysticism, the rose, or rather the scent of roses, is a chief characteristic of what has become known as the odour of sanctity, a floral, often rose-scented fragrance emanating from the body of saints and their stigmata, most notably the celebrated stigmatic Padre Pio's wounds and the bandages he used to wrap them in smelled of roses, supposedly, as did the body of Saint Therese of Lisieux at the time of her death. Lisieux, also known as the Little Flower, had a passion for roses, espousing the concept of a shower of roses, both literal and metaphorical, as evidence of God's presence. The mystical shower of roses took immediate hold, gripping the imagination of devout Catholics, augmented by Therese's writing, including the fervent poem To Scatter Flowers, written in 1896, a heady mix of desire, sacrifice and ecstasy, Juju, my only love, on Calvary I strew, with fond delight each evening my gathering of flowers, unpetaling for thee a rose of vernal hue, that I may dry thy tearful showers. And, even more intensely erotic, the petals of my flowers caress thy sacred face. They tell thee that my heart hath fled to thee above. Thou knowest well the language my leaf-strewn roses trace, and thou art smiling at my love. More recently, the rose, or at least its petals, have featured in another series of memorable erotic sequences. In the 1999 film American Beauty, directed by Sam Mendes, Lester Burnham, an advertising executive undergoing a midlife crisis, becomes infatuated with a friend of his daughter, the nubile Angela Hayes. As Burnham's obsession grows, he starts to receive visions of Angela amidst a sea of rose petals. And, in an especially visionary sequence, Burnham, suffering from mounted, unrequited sexual desire, imagines himself beneath a shower of falling rose petals, a carnal, cinematic reworking of St. Therese's beatific shower of roses, perhaps. The combination of pleasure and pain personified by the rose with its soft, seductive petals and sharp thorns has meant that it has become the perfect symbol of vulnerability and force. Here, magnificently portrayed by Burne Jones, in one of his four panels illustrating the Sleeping Beauty story. In this one, The Legend of the Briar Rose, we see the spectacularly armored and androgynous prince discovering the slumbering knights, Beauty's unsuccessful suitors. Entwined in the thorny embrace of the Briar Rose, their armor partly dis discarded, exposing soft flesh to deadly thorns, transforming these armor-plated champions into slumbering, unfulfilled and rose-scarred warriors. The substitution of petals for flesh and thorns for weapons strikes at the very duality of the rose, at once both tender and cruel, pleasurable and painful, a characteristic that the rose-obsessed René Magritte explores in his Blow to the Heart of 1952. A rose with a dagger, supplanting its thorns perhaps, or more surreally, a rose that wields a dagger, a disturbing vision of an attacking, weaponized rose. Magritte's painting also draws on the popular iconography of the rose, especially its centrality to the art of tattooing, where the rose has long been a traditional motif requested by those who partake in the surreal gesture of having their skin pricked by the tattooist needle rather than the thorns of the roses with which their bodies are so commonly marked. Whilst most rose and dagger tattoos choose to represent the flower pierced through its heart by the dagger, a popular sign understood as the eternal struggle between life and death, between beauty and cruelty, Magritte's rose itself is the aggressor, no longer pierced by the dagger, but brandishing its thorn, made even more deadly by its transformation into steel. As a slight digression, Tom Ford, in his apparently endless olfactory quest, has most recently attempted to bottle this rosy dichotomy in his fragrance Rose Prick, detailing for 228 pounds, roughly, I think about $312 for 50 mil. 
a blend of three roses, Turkish, Bulgarian, and the rare Rose de Mai, and which beyond the somewhat crude sexual illusion of its title is described on, on Ford's website as sharp and pristine, the piercing prickles of the stems hook onto each other, bonding their blooms in pink perfection. The pleasure, pain, beauty, cruelty binary of the rose explains its centrality to narratives of sexual desire, especially those of the sadomasochistic variety. Roses metaphorical and real abound in tales of agonizing love and the giving and receiving of pleasurable pain. One of the most explicit and for its time daring cinematic examinations of this trope can be found in the 1966 film, Red Roses of Passion, directed by cult erotic auteur Joe Sarno. The film presents the tale of Carla, bored and living a prudish existence with her maiden aunt until she becomes involved with the mysterious occult sect known as the Cult of Pan, who, according to the film's press release, have learned to harness the carnal powers of roses to entrap men into sexual liaisons, a plotline that is the catalyst for a series of laboriously staged black and white tableau shot using stark chiaroscuro lighting, the envy of the most fevered surreal imagination. Painter, poet and champion of surrealism Roland Penrose hints at the beauty and cruelty of the rose in one of his most haunting works, the portrait of his first wife, surrealist poet Valentine Bouet. Painted after they had separated, he depicts his ex-wife silenced and blinded by moths, while her neck is encircled by barbarously thorned rose stems, a device emblematic of their thorny, unconsummated relationship, here metamorphosized into a necklace of vicious rose thorns. In 1963, the British confectionery manufacturers Cadbury launched what would be one of their most enduring advertising campaigns for their most popular chocolate assortment, Cadbury's Roses, starring comedian Norman Vaughan. Headline Roses Grow On You, as roses suddenly sprouted from Vaughan's body, became an instant hit, helping boost the sales of the chocolates, which still remain a favourite in the UK today. This whimsical example of mid-20th century surrealist advertising illustrates another aspect of what could be considered an ordeal by roses. The phenomena of roses sprouting from, covering, or indeed subsuming the human body. The body made from flowers, or the body as flower, most frequently the rose, is a fantasy that has exercised the imagination of artists and designers in ever more fantastic creations of floral anatomy. Woman as Rose has inspired many of the most radical fashion designers of the 20th and 21st centuries, and blossoming amongst the rose gardens of couture are some of the most memorable of sartorial blooms, specimens that retain the crown of best in show. A perennial favorite, and arguably one of the most remarkable of fashion's blooms is Balenciaga's black silk gazelle of 1967, photographed here by Irving Penn, the model Sue Murray becomes an impossibly elegant rose woman, and the copy that accompanied the image makes explicit the, this vestimentary transformation, as it read, one perfect rose from Balenciaga, the face in the flower, left Balenciaga's extraordinarily beautiful cape of crumpled black gazelle that wraps around the head like a huge black rose, then at right falls back in a great gauzy crush around the body revealing a tiny diamante crown and beneath a narrow perfect stem of black crepe dinner dress. In this human horticultural hybrid, body as stem, cape as the crawler of petals, the human head and face usurps the position of the rose's reproductive organs and is dwarfed by the extravagant black flower, a surrealist fantasy echoing the attack Bataille made on our attraction to rose petals when he suggested if the sign of love is displaced from the pistol and stamens to the surrounding petals, it is because the human mind is accustomed to making such a displacement with regard to people. Woman as Rose, or rather woman becoming Rose, has continued to be cultivated by fashion's most radical gardeners. Ray Kawakubo for Comte de Garçon has taken a cutting from Balenciaga and made a hybrid Rose Woman for her spring-summer 2015 collection, Roses and Blood. For this presentation, and most strikingly captured by Paolo Reversi in this image, she has constructed a floral arrangement, a shower of roses perhaps, with the principal bloom, a cultivated human head crowning the luscious bloody blooms. Rather than a rose body becoming, Kawakubo opts for a bouquet at once seductive and threatening, a floral tribute composed of blood red rose heads, marking not only the collection's presentation in the centenary year of World War I, but also perhaps the equally bloody demise of fashion as we know it, especially given its current crisis. 
Both Balenciaga and Caracubo retain the human head in their various rose becomings or bouquets, but returning to mystic roses briefly, we encounter one of the earliest recorded instances of the head itself as a rose, a vision that has insistently inspired religious, artistic and fashionable iconography. The legend of St. Rose of Lima includes the source of the late 16th century religious ascetics rosy appellation. Before embarking on a short life of severe penitence, including fasting, sleep deprivation and wearing a heavy silver crown of thorns on her head, a servant allegedly witnessed her face miraculously turning into a rose. Giuseppe Arcimboldo, painter of the Habsburg court and famous today for his allegorical portraits of the elements and the seasons, seemed to preempt Rose of Lima's facial transformation. His enigmatic portraits, while resolutely secular in their appreciation of nature, rather than the result of any religious conviction, often feature emblematic representations of Primavera or spring and the goddess Flora, and feature heads and faces entirely composed of blooms, at once disturbing and seductive. These rosy visions culminated in a version of Flora where the typical trompe l'oeil effect of roses morphing into lips, nose and eyes, decidedly more floral than corporeal, um, give way to a threatening, one might say even monstrous rose being, blinded and silenced by blooms. A vision that once again returns us to the surrealists and the rose-haunted René Magritte, who painted and performed the rosy head, including his own hair in the photograph of him taken by Michael Cooper, rendered speechless and sightless by obscuring and silencing roses. The deployment of the rose as a symbol for silence and secrecy can be traced back to classical mythology and the story that Cupid used a rose to bribe Harpocrates, the god of silence and secrets, to remain silent about his mother Venus's various amorous indiscretions. Venus herself, of course, the goddess of beauty and love often being associated with the rose. In reference, in reference to this story, the ceilings of Roman banqueting rooms were often decorated with roses in order to remind revellers dining beneath that what was spoken of under the sign of the rose should not be mentioned outside. And by the Middle Ages, the sign of the rose was being used to encourage discretion on the part of councillors meeting to discuss affairs of state. And Henry VII's recently adopted Tudor rose, combining the Lancastrian red rose with the white rose of York following his triumph at the Battle of Bond field, the climax of the English Wars of the Roses, decorated his private chamber, where political decisions were made, hence the term we still use, use today, sub rosa, to demand a group or uh, an affiliation's discretion when meeting. The rose has continued to be cultivated in the global political landscape, with the white rose especially being implemented as an emblem for those whose existence remains secret or whose voices have been silenced. In the 18th century, the white rose was adopted as a political symbol by allies of the Jacobite cause, seeking the restoration of the Catholic House of Stuart to the thrones of Scotland, England and Ireland. Prominent Jacobite supporters to show their allegiance to the cause would be painted holding or wearing white roses, or even worn, as in the case of this rare example of Jacobite fashion, which bears in each of its dazzling red squares, a woven silk rose and two buds symbolizing James III of England and Ireland and VIII of Scotland, the old pretender, and his two sons, Charles, Bonnie Prince Charlie, and Henry Stuart. The jacket is an exceptional example of the rose incorporated into sartorial expression of political ideology, a tacit silken sign of dissent that remains secret except for those who are privy to the secret of the rose. So symbolically potent is the white rose as sign for secrecy, the oppressed and the silence, that the causes it espouses are as varied as the forms the species itself takes, and it continues to represent resistance and form a floral message of liberation for the disenfranchised. A white rose became the symbol of the intellectual Nazi resistance group called White Rose, formed in Munich in 1942. The movement was led by Hans and Sophie Scholl, German university students, who, along with several friends and their professors, were arrested and executed for distributing flyers and pamphlets denouncing the Nazi regime. This impassioned extract from their third pamphlet seems chillingly reminiscent of present day protests from groups marginalized, silenced or oppressed, whether due to racial, political or sexual ideologies. This is from their pamphlet, they suggest, our current state is the dictatorship of evil. We know that already. I hear you object and we don't need you to reproach us for it yet again. 
But I ask you, if you know that, then why don't you act? Why do you tolerate these rulers gradually robbing you in public and in private of one right after another until one day nothing, absolutely nothing remains but the machinery of the state under command of criminals and drunkards? Remaining with World War II, it is to the surrealist once again, in this case, Salvador Dali, to whom we owe one of the most enduring and indeed fashionable imaginings of the silent rose head, a trope Amy de la Haye discusses in her chapter on the rose in 20th century fashion. Dali's celebrated cover for the June issue of American Vogue, published just three months before the outbreak of World War II, with its silent rose-headed witness, skeletal marooned boat and oblivious wooden-headed skipping figure, seems to predict the unimaginable atrocities to come, stupefied silence being the only possible reaction. This haunting rose-headed figure was the result of Dali's growing obsession with this image, which we can trace in a succession of preceding works, clinging and supplicating here in his work, The Birth of Liquid Desires of 1931, fashionably erotic in Woman with a Head of Roses of 1935, in, in 1936, a year in which Dali's dreams were crowded with silent roses, here they become multiple, seem to revisit Archimbaldo in the work Necrophiliac Spring, and become literally the stuff of dreams and transformed into the artist's muse. And even finds herself, or finds her way rather, to a shop window anticipating the rose head seminal place in fashion marketing. And this, as you can see, was a Bonwick Teller window display based on, on Dali's uh, sketches in 1936. All this before finally making her way to Trafalgar Square in London, personified by performance artist Sheila Legg in what is perhaps the most seminal rose-headed appearance. This apocryphal event to mark the opening of the London International Surrealist Exhibition at the New Burlington Galleries in 1936 has assumed remarkable art historical status. It's still eerie presence matched by the growing number of myths associated with the event. Was the iconic photograph taken by Claude Cahoon? Did Sheila Legg wear surgical rubber or merely sat in elbow length gloves? Did she carry a pork chop as well as an artificial leg? Was her white dress, wedding dress made by celebrated theatrical costumier Motley? Were there ladybirds crawling over the rose head? Was she the lover of the rose obsessed Rennie Magritte? With only the photographic image remaining, these stories will continue to grow and proliferate like the petals of a rose. But whatever the facts, this image seems to have catalyzed a succession of floral headed, fashionably silent figures that continue to gaze sightless from their rosy masks. From the perennial favorite, the flower head hat, that for most of the latter half of the 20th century was beloved of royalty and mothers of the bride alike, via the full blown rose engulfed visions of Yun Takahashi's spring summer 2015 collection where feathers, hair and petals merge in Archimboldo-like composites. Onto the rose-headed sentinels that stalk Noir K. Nina Mia's floral universe and in that same season, most disquietingly perhaps, silenced Richard Quinn's muses, their impossibly bourgeois rose prints muffling any dissenting voice and confronting the audience with their blank, rose-filled oblivion. These floral enigmas undergoing their ordeal by roses continue to haunt us, silently reminding us of the impossibility of finding a voice perhaps, or merely the persistence of a surrealist memory. Of course, fashion's hothouse flowers, nursery reared commodities restrained and trained into silent beauty need artificial stimulants and indeed protection. Was this what Stephen Jones for Dior was suggesting when he wrapped the rarest of Galliano's bloom, blooms in cellophane? Cellophane that as Elizabeth Hawes, that most severe of gardeners suggested, was essential to maintain the illusion of fashion, suggesting watching them chase their own tails, done up neatly and gasping for breath in fashion's cellophane. Because cellophane not only adds an artificial luster, it also suffocates silences and makes complicit, rendering us voiceless as we are submerged in beauty, struck dumb as we drown in the petals of our ordeal by roses. Thank you. <laughs>